Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Paul Katsafanas. He is Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Boston University. He works on ethics, moral psychology, and 19th century philosophy. He is the author of the books Agency and the Foundations of Ethics, Nietzschean Constitutivism, and the Nietzschean Self, Moral Psychology, Agency, and the Unconscious. So, Dr. Katsafanas, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to do it. Okay, great. So, uh, I mean, I invited you on the show because I thought it was really interesting the fact that in your work you talk about moral psychology, but, um, I mean, you also refer to the work or the insights from Nietzsche, right? And yes. it's, inter it's interesting because, as far as I understand it, even though he was a bit aphoristic and sometimes he contradicted, he contradicted himself, uh, it's still the case that he had pretty good insights that it seems to me nowadays um, empirical psychology is confirming a lot of them, I guess. I, I think we could put it that way. But before we get into his specific insights, uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, so uh, why is it important for us to understand how human psychology works for the uh, for us to then be able to do philosophy particularly in this case ethics and moral philosophy yeah that's a great question so i think the general idea that nietzsche is working with is that ethics aims to provide a specification of what it is to live well or to flourish now not every ethicist is going to accept that sort of claim of course there are some who think that we can do ethics in complete independence of facts about human nature. But if you think that what ethics is trying to do is basically tell us how human beings, either individually or in terms of whole cultures, can uh, do well or badly, can flourish or fail to flourish, then it looks like you're going to need to know what human beings are. You're going to need to know what their central motivations are, um, which aspects of them are changeable versus which ones are fixed and unmovable. You're going to need to know about uh, characteristic emotions, types of psychological states and how they manifest themselves. Uh, you're going to know, you need to know about uh, the relation between the person's conscious thoughts about themselves and what they're doing and how that relates to the less reflective aspects of what they're doing. So um, in all those ways, I think you're going to need to know quite a lot about human nature if you're going to have an adequate account of what it is to live well or to flourish. So I think that's the general approach that, that Nietzsche is taking to these sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because we have this thing that we call, or Hume back then called the Isot dichotomy, right? Yes. And I mean, I guess that there's two issues here. The first one is that we can certainly uh, talk about how the world should be without regarding the facts or without taking any care uh, about them. But uh, on the other hand, it's also important, I guess, for us to understand how things are, and in this case particularly, what is our human nature, how we work, what are we influenced by, in what ways, and to what extent our human nature is flexible or malleable, because otherwise we could be idealizing a world that would not be possible to achieve, or we even could employ maybe certain methods to try to change people that wouldn't work and would be oppressive or something yes. like that, right? Yes, I think that's right. And I think that Nietzsche believes that that is the case, that because we've misunderstood human nature in various ways, a lot of the moral systems that have been propounded by philosophers and instituted in societies are actually damaging us rather than helping us to flourish. So he's very worried about that. And on the Humean point about uh, deriving thoughts from a claim about what is, I think that um, Nietzsche basically agrees with Hume on a version of that point. So 
even though Hume thinks that we can't derive odds from is uh, he does think that if we look at sentiments, desires, uh, motivational states of those sorts, that we can get conclusions about uh, what the person ought to do, right? So he thinks that um, our desires drive us in various ways or that our sentiments uh, dispose us to certain sorts of actions. Um, so while he wants to deny the idea that we can look at um, non-evaluative or non-sentimental facts about the universe and you know, get odds out of there, um, he seems okay with getting another type of odd out of his judgments. And I think that Nietzsche is broadly in that camp. So he thinks, Nietzsche thinks that, of course, if you just look at um, facts about the physical universe independently of what human beings actually desire and what they're motivated to do and so forth, you won't be able to get any normative claims out of that. But if we look at um, facts about human motivations, desires, the type of psychological state Nietzsche calls drives and so forth, then we can start thinking about what it would make sense for the person to do or what would be conducive to their flourishing. So I think that's the approach that he's pursuing. Sure. Okay, and it's very interesting because people have several different approaches to ethics and moral philosophy, right? And two, two of them are the rationalistic approach that is trying to derive, uh, for example, moral values just uh, through some process of reasoning or something like that and then uh, the, also the intuitionistic approach that is uh, relying on our intuitions about what we think is good and bad and basically uh, um, how the world should be but uh, I, I mean I guess that through uh, Nietzsche's perspective we get a sense that we have to be careful about approaches like those because for example, for the rationalistic one, it's not at all the case that we have some sort of mental mechanism operating in our minds that is completely detached from even our bodies, right, and our emotions and things like that. And on the intuitionistic side of things, uh, I mean, we can have uh, intuitions that contradict uh, our uh, the moral systems that we have in place in our societies like for example we have several different uh, drives or emotions that impel us to do certain things that we would consider bad from our own uh, social perspective let's say Right. Yes, I, I think that's right. So, uh, so Nietzsche is skeptical of both of those sorts of approaches that you've mentioned. He thinks that the rationalistic approach that we would find in people like Kant, for example, um, that that just isn't successful on its own terms. So Nietzsche thinks that if you look carefully at the arguments that those philosophers are propounding, that we always find uh, circularities or undefended assumptions or problematic inferences and so forth. So he doesn't think that we're going to be able to get um, a successful rationalistic model of ethics. Um, and also, as you were mentioning with the in the approach would be based on intuitions, um, which is very popular nowadays and also had adherence in Nietzsche's day. Um, a big problem with that is just that our intuitions can be misguided. So Nietzsche thinks that a lot of our intuitions are in fact misguided. People are confused about um, which actions actually promote good human lives and which are uh, harmful. So you see a lot of Nietzsche's texts arguing that um, even some of our most central intuitions, our faith in um, the value of compassion, for example, uh, Nietzsche thinks that this, although most of us will be inclined to think that compassion is a good thing, Nietzsche tries to argue that in various respects, it's quite damaging to us. So he thinks that we can be misled in our intuitive responses to circumstances. And more generally, I guess, the idea is that our intuitions depend on these background beliefs we have about what's valuable, what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. Um, sometimes they just defend, depend on background beliefs uh, that are prevalent in our cultures and so forth. And Nietzsche thinks that a lot of those background beliefs are, are false. So once you start critiquing those, uh, it's going to carry over into the intuitions that are generated by those background beliefs. So for all of those reasons, um, Nietzsche thinks that it's a mistake to think that either uh, through rationalistic inquiry or through reliance on intuitions that will get um, any defensible moral system or any uh, worthy conclusions about what ought to be done in it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, since we refer there that reason is not detached from the rest of our psychology and even our physiology, let's say, uh, I mean, w- another thing that we have to take into account, particularly when we're talking about intuitionistic approaches or approaches based on intuitions, is the fact that uh, there's also phenomena of post hoc rationalization, that is, we have an intuition and we are convinced that uh, it's right in some way and then we simply use our reasoning processes even though we are not conscious that we're doing that in that way but uh, to to come up with uh, reasons or arguments to keep defending the position uh, that we are completely convinced of. Yes, I, I think that's a very common phenomenon. Um, Nietzsche, in his text, he accuses several philosophers of doing exactly that. So he thinks that Kant, for example, is is doing exactly that. Um, other philosophers as well, of course. But I, I think that is extremely common, and I think you can see it even in ordinary life, that people will um, have some kind of reaction to something, and then they'll reach for an explanation that would justify that reaction. They'll confabulate, they'll make up reasons and justifications for something that, in fact, um, wasn't reached as a result of those uh, those sorts of rational factors. So yeah, I think Nietzsche thinks that that's extremely common, um, that we'll have some sort of reaction to something, uh, some sort of emotional response to something, and then just invent reasons for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk uh, about some specific insights of Nietzsche's that I think are important for us to then understand how we, through his insights, could get at a sort of uh, moral system or uh, some sort of psychological foundations to then build up a moral system. So uh, a very interesting thing that you talk about in your books is the reflective versus unreflective action. So what is that about and what what are Nietzsche's insights about that? Yeah, that's a very important topic for Nietzsche, I think. So in general, he's worried that most philosophers, other than him and a few others, um, have focused almost exclusively on conscious phenomena, and they haven't attended to the vast range of unconscious processes and factors that play a role in both in individual human actions and in uh, larger patterns of human activity that show up in societies and cultures and so forth. So he thinks that um, essentially there just hasn't been enough work on the unreflective sides of human behavior. Moreover, he thinks that those unreflective sides of human behavior actually play a much larger role in determining what we are and what we do than the conscious, reflective, deliberative phenomena. Uh, He thinks the conscious phenomena, they are important. They do um, have profound effects on us. But uh, he thinks it's a complete mistake to discount the role of these unconscious factors. So one thing that he wants to do is to provide an account of what these unconscious factors are, how they relate to the conscious factors, how they've played a role in shaping cultures and uh, moral systems and philosophical systems generally. So a lot of his work is devoted to elaborating those sorts of uh, theories and distinctions, as well as critiquing the philosophical theories that rest on the assumption that we're transparent to ourselves, that our conscious phenomena uh, are either the exclusive or the main drivers of what we do. He really wants to, to get away from that kind of assumption and to uh, show that it's really the unreflective, unconscious sides of us that play decisive roles in uh, shaping us and our cultures. Mm-hmm. And how does he think about the role that our conscious processes have? Does he think that it's a minor role and what kind of role exactly? For our conscious processes, so it's it's interesting. He sometimes does talk in a way that would suggest that he thinks conscious processes play a very minor role. But um, he also, at other times, will articulate ways in which conscious processes 
have had uh, disastrous long-term effects on culture and on individuals and so forth. So his considered view, I think, is that although most of what we do is driven by unconscious processes and unreflective processes, that nevertheless, the conscious processes, though they're intermittent, though they're um, not occurring uh, with the same frequency or the same, uh, they're not having the same degree of effects as the unconscious ones, nonetheless, they can really profoundly impact both individuals and cultures. So if you think about a lot of the things that Nietzsche is most critical of, uh, various religions, various moral philosophies, certain types of values, certain types of cultures, and so forth, a lot of those are things that just couldn't exist, couldn't have any effect if uh, the person's conscious uh, thoughts had no role in shaping. So, you know, if, if Nietzsche thinks, to put it simply, if he thinks that uh, having Christian beliefs is damaging, then it has to be that uh, these Christian beliefs, some of which are conscious and which are certainly consciously acquired in some cases, um, are going to have uh, a causal impact on the person. So I think that he does want to say that these conscious reflective phenomena have a tremendous role. I mean, that's part of what he is trying to draw attention to um, with these critiques of Christianity, these critiques of Kant and other moral philosophers and so forth. Uh, they do have a tremendous role, but it's a mistake to treat them as the only important thing. It's a mistake to overlook the way in which these conscious processes depend on unconscious ones. Um, and what he really wants to offer us is a view according to which both the conscious and the unconscious interact with one another and shape one another and have causal impacts on one another. So that's what he tries to draw out, I think, in some of his more detailed investigations of uh, the way in which, for example, Christianity or Kantianism or Platonism are, are damaging us. Right. And how does he think about the unconscious? I mean, is it something that is in some way represented in our minds? Because, for example, when we think about conscious representations, we think about images, sounds, yeah. verbal representations. I mean, is the unconscious represented or the processes of the unconscious represented in some way in our minds? Or is it something completely different. So, as I understand Nietzsche's view, he thinks that the, the unconscious processes and states are not going to be directly accessible through introspection in the way that conscious thoughts are. So, you know, if I'm looking out the window and seeing some sight, I can just reflect on it and think about what I'm seeing. Or if I'm consciously reasoning or talking to someone, I can uh, generally introspect at least some of the thoughts that are available there. He thinks that unconscious thoughts are going to be different. There will be ways of detecting them, but um, they, will, they will be indirect. So I can look at behavioral evidence. I can look at uh, gaps in my uh, conscious thought processes and explain some of those gaps and intermittencies by uh, thinking about unconscious states that may have uh, been implicated there. I can look at my emotional reactions to various things or the motives that I have more generally. And I can think about how they might be unified by some underlying unconscious um, state or event. So I can get at them indirectly in those ways. I can also look at other people and um, try to ascertain what their real motives are, what might be you know, I can see that somebody tells themselves that they're acting for a certain reason, and maybe the person genuinely believes that, but in a lot of cases, I can speculate that something more is going on, that there are these unconscious factors that the person's unaware of. So Nietzsche thinks that uh, the unconscious won't be introspectively accessible in the way that the conscious states generally are. And part of the explanation for that, actually, is that Nietzsche thinks that conscious phenomena are going to be linguistic or conceptual in a way that unconscious phenomena aren't. So in some of his discussions of the distinction between the conscious and the unconscious, he'll claim that only conscious thinking is linguistic or conceptual. So his view seems to be that when I have a conscious perception or a conscious belief or even a conscious emotion, that part of the content of that conscious state is going to be given in terms of concepts or even in terms of words, whereas he thinks the unconscious is going to be somehow um, more diffuse. It's not going to have that sort of linguistic or conceptual articulation. So I might have some unconscious thought, 
or unconscious feeling and struggle to put it into words, struggle to uh, come to an accurate description of it. But when I do so, when I try to render that unconscious thing conscious, some of it will always slip away. I'll always be falsifying it or giving a superficial version of it to some extent by forcing it into this linguistic or conceptual form. Once I do that, once it's linguistic or conceptual, it's conscious and I can more easily talk about it, communicate it, think about it to myself or you know, convey it to others. But the, the unconscious phenomena for Nietzsche are going to be these non-linguistic or non-conceptual phenomena. That's part of what makes them so elusive for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are the dynamics between the conscious and the unconscious? Is it that, I mean, it's a two-way street, yes. uh, both, both the unconscious influences the conscious and vice versa, and yes. in what ways? Yeah, so I think Nietzsche's view is definitely that it's a two-way interaction. So the unconscious can give rise to various conscious phenomena. So, for example, I can have some sort of unconscious uh, motivational state um, where I'm, I'm driven toward acting in some way. And perhaps parts of that will become conscious as my having various desires or attractions or aversions. So the unconscious can cause various uh, conscious states to arise. So there's, there's certainly that direction of interaction. But Nietzsche also thinks that the conscious can have this impact on the unconscious. And the examples of that are more complicated. One example that Nietzsche talks about at length uh, comes from his book, The Genealogy of Morality, mm -hmm. where he talks about the way in which an unconscious state that he calls bad conscience is uh, consciously experienced by certain individuals as guilt. So the idea is that I have this um, unconscious state, just call it bad conscience, um, I interpret that and come to experience it consciously as the phenomenon of guilt. By experiencing it consciously in that way, Nietzsche thinks that I create changes in my unconscious mental economy. So interpreting, um, I mean, I guess some other examples of this would be things like thinking of my behavior as sinful or um, thinking of myself as uh violating God's commands or something like that. If I'm a religious individual operating with those concepts, then Nietzsche thinks those concepts certainly are having a tremendous impact on my life. They're leading me to experience um, certain types of activities as sinful, or, uh, and that's going to make me averse to them, at least to some extent. It's going to make me experience guilt when I perform them. Whereas if I'd interpreted them in some other way, um, in a neutral way, for example, then I'd have a very different uh, set of motivations and set of reactions when I'm performing them. So the conscious interpretation of unconscious states in a certain way can uh, causally impact the agent's unconscious behavior um, and the, the, the agent's unconscious mental economy generally. So Nietzsche does think it's a two-way street. That's part of why he's so worried about the conscious interpretations, actually. So with the one I just mentioned about guilt, for example, he thinks that one is quite damaging to our uh, flourishing, both at the individual and cultural level. So he thinks that we can sometimes be trapped into experiencing an unconscious phenomenon in terms of some conscious conceptual uh, interpretation, which then impacts what we are. It, it then impacts the way that we act, the experiences that we have, the emotions that we have, sometimes in ways that are quite damaging and that are hard to break free of. So yeah, he thinks that um, the unconscious causally influences the conscious, but also that the conscious can shape and causally interact with the unconscious. Um, and it's partly for that reason that he wants to investigate the interactions between those two sides of our minds. Mm -hmm. And since he refers to how our acquiring certain concepts from our culture might influence the way we think or even experience certain things, does he also say anything uh, about language influencing yeah. our thought processes? Because, I, I mean, it's a bit complicated, right? Because on the one hand, he has some insights about the unconscious and how we don't have direct access to it and how it influences the conscious. So, I mean, 
he, it seems to me that it's clear that he's saying that we can have thoughts without language, right? But, yes. uh, but language, once we acquire it and once we acquire certain concepts, they might influence our thought processes, right? And, and I'm asking this just because there's this hypothesis that is a whole, a old, an old hypothesis in linguistics, the sapir Worf hypothesis, yeah. that, that in its extreme version would be something like uh, our language even influencing the structure of reality itself as we experience it and our senses and things like that. But it seems to me that Nietzsche even though he thinks that language can certainly influence how we think, it doesn't go uh, that direction, right? Well, you know, sometimes, I mean, I think you're right that he doesn't um, say too much about that direction, but there are actually a few passages where he'll talk about language um, influencing even our most basic sense of reality. So he'll talk about logic, for example, uh, being a product of uh, linguistic phenomena, which would suggest that even these like very basic categorizations and patterns of inference and so forth are somehow uh, linguistically structured. He'll sometimes talk about um, the idea of subjects and objects um, or substances and properties, those things as being uh, influenced by uh, certain types of languages and suggest that were we to have a different type of language, we wouldn't experience or conceptualize things in the same way. So he doesn't say all that much about that, but I think there is a strand of uh, remarks in his texts and even more so in his notebooks where he'll, um, he'll sometimes be tempted by that way of thinking. But yeah, I think you're right that um, for the most part, like the more extended discussions of these phenomena that he has um, aren't pitched at that level. They're, um, they're more like this phenomenon that I was describing a minute ago where he's worried that, uh, for example, I interpret some unconscious underlying state in terms of guilt or something like that, whereas I could have employed some other non-moralized concept to interpret it. So it's usually at a higher level of generality. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that he does think that, um, uh, to go back to the, the way you started the question, he, he does think that you can have thoughts and emotions and desires and even inferences of certain kinds that aren't linguistic. So you can have a lot of types of mental activity that uh, they're determinate in various ways, but they're not um, fully explained or fully characterizable in terms of language and concepts. When we characterize them in that way, Nietzsche thinks we're distorting them to some extent. And there, he is picking up on some strands in earlier ways of thinking about the unconscious that are present in the, the, uh, you know, the 18th and earlier in the 19th centuries, where some thinkers, um, people like Helmholtz and uh, some others who aren't read as much nowadays, like uh, Fechner and some others, uh, are thinking that there's a difference in the structure of unconscious thought. So it's not just that unconscious thoughts are exactly analogous to conscious ones, but without the awareness. It's rather that um, unconscious thoughts and unconscious processes have a different logic. They obey different relations. The, the states are individuated in different ways. There are different types of things than the conscious thoughts. So Nietzsche does have something like that view, I think. And it's, uh, you know, there are a number of philosophical difficulties in trying to explain how that would work, in part because when we talk about the unconscious states, we're obviously using concepts and language. So it's hard even to express the, the kind of view that Nietzsche wants to express. But I, I do think there's something somewhat intuitive about it. So I think there's a, an ordinary phenomenon of struggling to put your thoughts into words and feeling like even when you've done so, some stuff has been left behind or has been distorted. I think this is especially true of uh, affects and emotions and so forth. I can feel a certain way and I can spend a lot of time trying to like characterize that, come up with a description of it. Um, and I, I often feel like I haven't quite got it. But nonetheless, when I describe it in a certain way, when I conceptualize it in a certain way, that can sometimes seem to shift what this emotion is. So think about, um, I don't know, you can think about romantic episodes or something like that. Like think about the difference between you know, having certain feelings towards someone and uh, conceptualizing that feeling in terms of love 
versus lust or something like that. I mean, there can be an ambiguous phenomenon. And then when you experience it consciously as one rather than the other, that can really make a difference in uh, your future feelings and interactions with a person and so forth. Um, so part of what Nietzsche is trying to pick up on, I think, is that kind of phenomenon where it seems to make a difference how we think of our own mental states, how we think of our own emotions in this case. And um, two things seem to be true. Like, first of all, it seems to be true that there's difficulty in even coming to an adequate linguistic or conceptual description of something that we have um, some kind of non-linguistic or non-conceptual grasp on. Uh, so there's that. But there's also the fact that once we do articulate it in a certain way, that seems to shift things. It seems to transform, at least to some extent, the thing that we were originally trying to describe. So once I start thinking of this as love rather than lust or mere attraction or something like that, that makes a difference. That changes what the emotion is for me. Maybe not completely, because I could always you know, change my mind later on or find out that I'm wrong or something like that. But it does seem to have a causal impact. And, and that's the sort of thing that I think Nietzsche is trying to get at here. So let's now talk about a couple of concepts or topics that come about frequently when people are discussing ethics and moral philosophy and that Nietzsche also talks about. That is the concepts of freedom, agency and responsibility because they seem to me to be very interrelated and I mean it's very hard to talk about agency without talking about freedom and the same for responsibility uh, or being morally responsible in this case. So uh, how does Nietzsche think about the issue of freedom? Because since he acknowledge, acknowledges that uh, I mean, we don't have complete control over what happens in our minds and most of it is unconscious and we don't even have access to it. And so, I mean, it, it, it turns out that it's pretty hard for us to even deal with our own, uh, own minds and our motivations and understanding what's behind our own actions. I mean, does he think that we have some degree of freedom or not? Yeah, that's a good question. So. He says a couple of things about this, so it's a little complicated. So one thing is that he thinks there are multiple conceptions of freedom. So you know, he famously says in the genealogy of morality that only that which has no history can be defined. Right? So he thinks that um, there are always going to be multiple things that we could mean by freedom. Um, some people are going to mean one thing by it, others are going to mean something completely different. So he does think that there are multiple conceptions of freedom and he thinks that some of them are just completely uh, ludicrous or unacceptable or confused. Uh, some of them just have to be rejected. So for example, he's completely opposed to what's sometimes called the libertarian conception of freedom, where freedom is conceived as a kind of independence from uh, causal determination by anything prior. So the idea that a libertarian might have is that um, what I choose to do right now is just completely um, undetermined by any elements of my psychology, by anything that came prior to what's happening now. And Nietzsche thinks that's impossible. So he thinks that our actions are going to be causally influenced and in some cases determined by what comes prior. So we're not gonna have a conception of freedom uh, like the libertarian one that could work. He also thinks that a lot of conceptions of freedom are tied to a sort of vindictive urge to blame or hold people responsible for things that they may in fact not be responsible for. So this is again something that he talks about a lot in the genealogy, but he basically argues that one thing that can motivate people to talk about freedom is this desire to make themselves feel better or to achieve some social status or something like that by blaming other people for uh, for holding them down, for oppressing them, or even just being a person. So he thinks that there's a conception of freedom that's tied very tightly to a need to blame other people, and he thinks that one's going to be problematic as well. Um, and then there are others, so he thinks that the Kantian conception of freedom, for example, is going to be problematic because of what Nietzsche views as an illegitimate 
association of freedom and a certain kind of rationality or autonomy. So he wants to get rid of all sorts of types of accounts of freedom. But nonetheless, he does seem to have his own account of freedom that he wants to endorse, that he wants to argue for. And I guess one way of understanding it is I think that he sees himself as manifesting the kind of freedom that he wants to, to talk about. So the kind of freedom that he wants to talk about is it's not an independence from causal determination. It's not um, a Kantian conception of freedom as autonomy, where autonomy is conceived in this rationalistic manner. It's not tied um, like those other conceptions that I was mentioning to a need to blame anyone or anything like that. What he instead wants to do is tie freedom to a certain kind of notion of uh, critical self-determination. So he thinks that one thing um, that he himself, that Nietzsche is doing, is looking at his own patterns of reacting to things, looking at the values that he um, employs in his deliberations, looking at the motives that he has, the ideals and goals that he's striving to realize, and not just taking them for granted, but instead being genuinely critical about them, mm -hmm. thinking about where they come why he them, whether he should reject them, um, whether there's really any good reason for him to hold to those goals. Um, so he's critiquing values and ideals and goals and motivations and thinking very deeply about their histories, their genealogies and so forth. Um, that kind of critical inquiry into one's motives and ideals and values, I think that can be understood as a type of freedom. Because what Nietzsche is doing there is not just letting himself be buffeted about by whatever you know values his culture accepts or whatever values he was brought up with, whatever goals his parents implanted in him or his culture implanted in him. Instead, he's deciding these things for himself. He's being genuinely, open-mindedly critical about these things and trying to come to his own assessment of them. And I think that is something that could be associated with freedom. It's a type of self-determination, not in the sense of your uh, sort of causally independent of everything else, but instead just in the sense that you're genuinely critical about these things. I mean, you're never going to be able to have total independence. Nietzsche recognizes that his inquiries are always provisional. They can always be overturned by further inquiries and so forth. But he's at least attempting to understand himself, to understand these values that he operates with and so forth, and to reject some and accept others. So that kind of freedom as a kind of critical self-reflection, a kind of genealogical investigation of the values and motives and ideals that you're operating with. I think that's what Nietzsche is associating with the kind of freedom that he accepts. So it's very different than those other conceptions of freedom um, and fits better with his claims about how opaque we are to ourselves and how we need to, to dig into these values and look at their histories and so forth. So that's the one that he wants, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's basically about struggling consciously to trying to uh, criticize as much as possible and uh, questioning, uh, I mean, our own behavior and how we think and maybe thinking about where, uh, how we've been influenced by several different types of sources, environmental and others and things like that. I mean, it's that kind of uh, effortful action that provides the individual with some degree of freedom. Yes, I think that's right. So if you think about how Nietzsche is living his own life, looking at his cultural context, the ideals that are taken for granted in his society, the values, the moral systems, the, even the basic philosophical assumptions and so forth, trying to critique all of that. Um, no one will be able to do this completely and it will always be provisional. But Nietzsche is thinking that to the extent that you engage in these processes, you're going to be freer in this sense of freedom than someone who doesn't do that, someone who just blindly accepts um, you know, their cultural standards and so forth and lives with those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay, and talking about responsibility, I mean, to what extent he thinks that we should hold people responsible or consider them responsible for their own actions, particularly when they are moral actions? Yeah, so I think just as he's skeptical 
of various accounts of freedom and thinks that there are several different accounts that we could have of freedom, all of which might be doing different things. He thinks the same sort of point is true of responsibility. So there's not just like one conception of responsibility, but there are lots of different ways that we can understand that notion. And some of them he completely rejects, others he's happier with. So uh, for example, one that he would completely reject would be the idea that um, every agent is responsible in a causal sense, you know, in the sense that they're like the ultimate causal origin of whatever actions they perform. There are some accounts of responsibility that are like that. Nietzsche thinks that's going to be an illusion. Most people are just sort of buffeted about by cultural and social and environmental forces. It's not that their conscious reflection or their deliberative judgments are really doing much, really impacting them very much. It's more that they're just carried along. So that, uh, that type of responsibility that I just mentioned, where we try to find these ultimate causal origins, is not going to apply to, to people very often, or not at all, really. Um, nonetheless, Nietzsche does think that there's a sense of responsibility that we can operate with. So um, this gets into some distinctions in his theory of agency. So he sometimes draws a distinction between actions that are attributable to the agent versus actions that um, don't seem to be in the same way attributable to the agent. So Nietzsche thinks that some people are genuinely acting in a way that others aren't. And he thinks that these genuine actions are quite rare, but that the responsibility judgments are gonna correlate with them in some way. So um, what he has in mind there, if you think about some of his typical explanations of what ordinary human beings are like, he thinks that most of the time we're just deeply confused about what we're doing and why. Our unconscious motivations don't correspond very much at all to our conscious conceptualization of those things. So, you know, to use one of his examples, when he talks about the, the priests and the slaves and the genealogy of morality, um, there he describes these people who think that they're acting for certain types of uh, what they consider to be moral reasons. But when you actually look at their behavior, it's fueled by these resentments and unconscious types of conceit and envy and so forth. Um, they're self-deceived. They, uh, they don't have a very clear grasp of what they're doing at all. He thinks most people are going to be like that to some extent. Um, but some people will be more clear-headed about what they're doing. Or if, even if they don't presently have a good grasp of what they're doing and why, they'll nonetheless, um, if they were to come to a good grasp of what they're doing and why, they would continue to act in the same way. Whereas the priests and slaves that he describes in the genealogy, Nietzsche thinks that their actions actually depend upon their being self-deceived in the sense that if they were to, to realize what they're doing, they would act in a very different manner. So Nietzsche, I think, sometimes tries to articulate a sense of genuine action where what it is to, to perform one of these genuine actions is to act in a way where if you knew everything that there was to know about the, the causal history of your action, all the unconscious motives and so forth that are figuring into it, you'd continue to want to act in the same way. Um, then there's a kind of unity to yourself a kind of unity to your motivational profile. Whereas these other individuals that I was describing, the slaves and the priests and just the ordinary human beings, um, if you reveal to them why they're acting in the ways that they're acting, it will disrupt their actions. Their actions will be dependent upon their having a false conception of what they're doing and why. So that were you to provide them with more knowledge of what they're doing, their actions would just collapse. Nietzsche thinks that an agent like that is disunified in in an interesting way. Um, their unconscious motives are at odds with their conscious thinking. And that there's a sense in which we can say that it's only the former sort of person, the person who doesn't have that disunity, that's um, performing a full-fledged genuine action that we might want to say they're responsible for. Um, whereas the other type, they're just, uh, they're sort of splintered and driven. There's no clear answer to um, whether the person is responsible for the action in that sense. So I, I think that's one thing that I want to say about those cases. Mm -hmm. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that one of the things or several of, of the things Nietzsche is worried about and I mean, nowadays in psychology, experimental psychology and so on, people have been noticing that that's important to do uh, and to study that is, he's interested uh, in where people's behavior or actions come from, but also on how people think 
about their own behavior and uh, also how people think about their own behavior and the behavior of other people and how they evaluate themselves and other people and also the mismatches that occur there because it is frequently the case i guess that uh, when people are evaluating their own actions, their own moral behavior and the behavior of others. I mean, sometimes uh, it's, it's easy for people to get into a situation where we would call them hypocrites because they are using... Uh, they are using a, a sort a set of criteria to evaluate their own actions and another to evaluate the actions of others uh, just because sometimes they don't want to feel morally responsible for their own actions or they don't want to think that they are as free as other people are and so they are not that responsible for their own actions or they think that they're just doing what is good and other people that are doing different things are motivated in completely different ways. So, uh, I, I mean, th that those are things that really interest Nietzsche and uh, are really good insights into people's psychology even nowadays. Right? Yes, I think that's right. I think it's very interesting how a lot of the contemporary empirical research in psychology is uncovering some of these uh, features of human agency that Nietzsche was very interested in. So these um, studies that you're describing where we find that there are discrepancies between the way that I evaluate myself and think about my own agency and so forth as compared to how I think about someone else's. Um, I think Nietzsche is very interested in that phenomenon. More generally, just the idea that uh, we're mostly ignorant of our actions and our motives and so forth, which a lot of these studies in empirical psychology confirm. Um, those are exactly the sorts of factors that Nietzsche was interested in. Um, with respect to the hypocrisy and so forth that you're mentioning, I think Nietzsche is also, yeah, he's quite interested in that. He thinks that, um, I guess going back to the genealogy of morality, for example, in the, the case of the what he calls the priests and the slaves that I was mentioning, um, one thing that he thinks is going on there is that that people are sort of tacitly developing a whole way of thinking about agency and human motivation and so forth, so as to be able to blame um, certain types of people for uh, their behavior and their characteristics and so forth, um, um, and to think of themselves in this uh, vindicatory way. So like at, at a very high level of generality, what Nietzsche is basically arguing in the genealogy is that a, a sort of social underclass comes to accept a way of conceptualizing human agency and morality so that they can think of themselves as these exemplary, powerful, appealing individuals, and um, also so that they can disparage and reject uh, the people who actually are dominant and powerful and so forth. So I think that sort of hypocritical mode of reasoning um, and the kinds of self-deception and self-ignorance that go along with it, those are definitely things that um, Nietzsche is alive to and investigates. Um, both as cultural phenomena and as individual phenomena. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that another aspect, and because I referred to uh, how we think about our own actions as good and perhaps the actions of other people as bad, and one topic that he also explores in the genealogy of morals, I guess, is that he talks about how uh, we, by thinking that we are doing good things or that we are the good people, sometimes we enforce our morality on others, yeah. uh, uh, resorting to things that we ourselves should consider bad if we were to be uh, co uh, coherent with ourselves, let's say, because, uh, I mean, he talks even about uh, a little bit about the history of how people imposed what he calls the uh, Jew, um, the Christian morality, let's say, re resorting to mechanisms of social oppression and torture and things like that. And I mean, it, uh, it, and it, it's interesting because those same things, people, uh, th those same people would think that if they were performed on themselves, at least, would be bad. Yeah, so Nietzsche definitely does uh, 
think that that's true. I mean, there are good examples uh, in the genealogy, for example, of um, him citing these historical figures within Christianity, um, like Tertullian and others, where um, they're having these very graphic fantasies of revenge on uh, nobles or on, on people they regard as sinners, um, where it's just completely clear from the descriptions of these passages that people like Tertullian are fantasizing about um, themselves as very powerful and as looking on as people are tortured and uh, harmed in various ways, while these same people are consciously thinking of themselves as these merciful, compassionate, benevolent people who shy away from power and reject worldly goods and so forth. So you can see in a lot of these cases that um, the people are quite hypocritical in a very transparent way. Um, and he's just great at sort of digging out those hypocrisies and exposing them. He thinks that you can find stuff like that in Kant, in Pascal, and in, in lots of other people as well. And a lot of his writings, um, both on particular people and on uh, broader factors about human beings, uh, will sort of draw attention to those phenomena. Um, so I think that's definitely right, that there's um, there's a tendency for us to deceive ourselves about what's really motivating us. Um, uh, and there's a tendency for us to disguise some of our true motivations from ourselves um, in an effort to think about ourselves as upstanding or as worthy of praise or something like that, um, while at the same time we apply contrary judgments to other people. Uh, so I, I think that's definitely true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we move on to the last part of the interview, I guess that there's another big topic in Nietzsche's uh, philosophical psychology, let's say, that we should talk about. That is the one of drives or Nietzschean drives. So uh, what are drives for Nietzsche and in what ways do they operate in our minds? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a very important component of Nietzsche's uh, philosophical psychology, his account of human agency and motivation. So he talks a lot about drives, and drives uh, seem to play this key role in lots of things for him, in the explanation of our values, the explanation of the self, the explanation of particular things that we do. Uh, so they, they play a lot of key roles in important um, topics that Nietzsche's addressing. Um, I guess the most basic way of thinking about what drives are is by trying to distinguish them from ordinary desires. Because drives are going to be, you know, at a, at a high level of generality, they're going to be analogous to desires in the sense that they're things that dispose us to act in various ways. But the reason why Nietzsche likes to talk about drives rather than just desires is because he thinks there's a relevant distinction in the basic types of motivations that people have. And I guess the basic idea is that for most ordinary desires, um, what we're being motivated to do by these desires is to bring about some kind of change in the world. So for example, I have a desire for coffee. Um, what that motivates me to do is to, to drink some coffee. Or I have a, you know, I'm sleepy and I have a desire to rest. What that motivates me to do is to put myself to bed or take a nap or something like that. So drives are supposed to be different in that they're not aiming to bring about changes in the world. Um, rather, what they're disposing us to do is just to manifest certain types of activity. So if you think about uh, the aggressive drives or the sex drives, what these things are supposed to be doing for Nietzsche is not really motivating us to attain anything in particular, but rather just to manifest aggressive activity or to manifest sexual activity. Um, so the difference, uh, the most basic difference between drives and ordinary desires is that desires aim at bringing about some state of affairs which once it's attained, eliminates the desire, right? So I'm thirsty, I aim to eliminate that thirst by drinking water. Um, drives aren't like that. Drives motivate us to express some type of activity, like aggressive activity. And once I express that activity, the drive isn't satisfied. Rather, that tends to heighten the drive. It tends to make it want even more of that activity, right? So if I start acting aggressively, the temptation to just keep doing more and more of that for the aggression to spread and magnify itself. The same is true of other types of drives that Nietzsche talks about. Um, sexual drives, creative drives, intellectual drives, and so forth. So the key feature there is that the drive motivates us to engage in some characteristic process of activity where performing that process of activity doesn't satisfy the drive, but instead encourages the drive to motivate even more of that type of activity. So that's supposed to be one of the key differences. And then Nietzsche thinks that um, 
drives are, of course, going to motivate us to do particular things. So in order to manifest aggression, I have to do that in some particular way. I have to like play some sport or be aggressive towards some particular person or something like that. So they do need to find objects. These, uh, these aggressive activities need to find objects, but the objects aren't the primary concern of the activity. What the person really wants is just to express the activity. So the objects are, are accidental in a way that they're not for ordinary desires. So that's going to be a key difference. And the expression of a characteristic type of activity. And given that Nietzsche thinks that drives are going to be pretty pervasive in human action, so he thinks that uh, basically everything we do can be traced back to yeah, either one drive or some collection of drives that are interacting. Um, if that's right, then either most or even perhaps all of what we do is going to have a different structure than we're inclined to think. So we ordinarily think that we're acting so as to attain particular goals. But if Nietzsche's right, the attainment of goals isn't really what we're after. What we're after is the expression of certain types of activity in these ever heightening patterns. Um, and that uh, by understanding myself as driven to, to do some particular thing and thinking that the desire will dissipate once I do that particular thing, Nietzsche thinks I'm going to be misunderstanding myself and misunderstanding human activity in general. What humans are really aiming at is not the attainment of particular ends, but the expression in ever more heightened and pervasive ways of certain patterns of activity. And that'll have these ramifications for how he thinks about values human flourishing, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And what does Nietzsche mean by the will? What is the will about? Yeah, good question. So, um, so like responsibility and freedom, he uses that word in a couple of different ways. So um, in some passages, he'll just say there's no such thing as the will. Oh, the will is a fiction. It's something that's been invented that, uh, that we should do away with. When he's talking about the will in that sense, what he usually has in mind is the way that um, philosophers like Kant and others have traditionally used the term, where the will is understood as this um, faculty that gives us a kind of independence from our own desires and our motivations more generally. So in other words, a lot of philosophers think that what it means to say that I have a will is to say that I can sort of step back from my motivational states, my beliefs, my dispositions, and I can sort of um, gain a kind of independence from them where they no longer push and pull me, where I can critically reflect on them, and where I can then exercise my freedom in deciding to act on one of them rather than some other. So, you know, I have a desire to, um, to help someone versus a desire to just go on vacation. And I like step back and critically assess those things and decide, okay, I should do the right thing and you know, do it. Um, he thinks that sort of thing is fictional, that we don't have this faculty that enables us to gain a complete independence from our desires and to achieve that kind of critical distance from them. Because even when we think we're doing that, the desires, the environmental factors, the you know, facts about my psychology, they're still impacting my critical reflection. So what looks like standing back from the desires is really a case of still being influenced by them, sometimes even being influenced by the very desire that I'm reflecting on, or motive that I'm reflecting on. So he doesn't like the talk of the will in that sense, and he'll, he'll say that that's fictional. Nonetheless, he, he talks about willing and the will quite a bit in a more positive sense. So when he's talking about the will of the sort that he believes in, um, what he usually has in mind relates to what I was describing as his conception of freedom a bit earlier. So he thinks that um, although we don't have a will in the sense of this punctual uh, thing that can allow, allow us to stand back and gain this critical distance and so forth, we do have the capacity to critically reflect on our behavior on our motives and our values and so forth. And that critical reflection can have an impact on future actions and commitments and so forth. So it doesn't have a, um, a definitive impact. So it's, he doesn't think that merely by deciding not to express some motive or merely by deciding to have some value that I'll automatically be guaranteed to do that thing. But he does think that um, through these processes of critical reflection and scrutiny and genealogy and historical investigation and so forth, that I can sometimes come to gradually shift the ways in which I act, the motives that I operate on, 
the values that I hold. Um, in that sense, we can talk about a person having a will, where the will isn't conceived of as this thing that's exempt from calls of determination or that is so powerful that it can override any competing forces or anything like that. Instead, the will is just conceived as one factor among many others, but as a factor that can make a difference, especially in these aggregative, long-term stretches of behavior. So the will there would just mean something like the agent's capacity for critical reflection and intervention in his or her own behavior, um, where it's not guaranteed to be efficacious, but which sometimes does have an impact. So, you know, for an example, obviously, the way that Nietzsche acts, given that he critically reflects on his values for such extended periods of time and tries to modify his own behavior and so forth, he's going to end up acting very differently than um, what a person who's in his you know, analogous social situation and so forth, but just passively accepts all the distinctions and values and ideals present in his culture. Um, so we can be said to have a will in the sense that we can impact our behavior in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last question. Sure. Uh, what is Nietzsche's morality? Or to put it in other words, uh, knowing all of these, what does Nietzsche says about how we should use this knowledge about how our minds work and how we behave to develop uh, moral systems. And I mean, th does, he, does he believe that uh, it would be in any way possible for us to discover a set of universal moral values that all people should hold? Because, I, I mean, he is associated with some philosophical approaches like perspectivism, right? And I guess that, in a sense, when you read Nietzsche, it seems to me that uh, it would inevitably lead, to, uh, lead us toward a moral relativism. Is that right or not? I think, I think you know, it depends on how you understand relativism, but I think a version of that is right. So he, he certainly rejects the idea of universal moral truths that would be applicable to every human being, every culture, and so forth. So he, he rejects that kind of aspiration. He doesn't think we're going to get anything like that. Um, he does think, though, that uh, some moral systems can be better and worse than others. So he's not a total relativist. You know, he's not a relativist of the sort who thinks that like any moral system is as good as any other moral system, that it's sort of completely arbitrary which one you accept. You can see that in his critiques of Christianity, for example. He thinks that the Christian moral system is a bad one and that uh, what he's proposing is a better one. So he does think that you can sort of evaluate different moral systems. So there's not going to be one best one. Uh, or one uniquely correct one, but there will be ways of ranking different ones as better and worse than one another. So you won't get a unique answer, but you will get uh, hierarchies or rankings or ways of criticizing some systems as defective. And basically the way that that's gonna work for him is, uh, this ties back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about human nature. He thinks that uh, you can think about, so first of all, if you think of morality as trying to tell us what it is to live well or to flourish, um, then some moral systems can do a, a better and worse job at that than others. Um, some moral systems can render us self-deceived and conflicted and torn against ourselves. He, he thinks basically that Christian morality is like that. Um, other moral systems can allow us to be more harmonious um, with ourselves, to not suffer from the need for self-deception and so forth. So one thing he wants to do is look at those sorts of factors. But of course, that raises a question about how we should understand what it is to flourish, right? So if, if his basic idea is that uh, the moral systems that enable us to flourish are the good ones, and the moral systems that imperil flourishing are bad and should be rejected, then we need to know like, what it is to flourish, because obviously people can have different conceptions of what that is. I mean, maybe, maybe a Christian thinks that flourishing is being devoted to God in some ascetic, self-lacerating manner or something like that. So Nietzsche needs some kind of um, argument. He needs some kind of specification of what it is to, to flourish. And this is where I think his remarks on what he calls will to power come to play an important role. So um, that's a notion that, especially in his later works, comes to be um, increasingly important for him. And it's somewhat mysterious, so there are a lot of scholarly controversies about what he means by will to power. Um, the interpretation that I have of it uh, 
is that I think that it's tied to the notion of drives that I was describing earlier. So I think that when Nietzsche says that we will power, um, what he's trying to do is point to a fact about the way in which we're motivated. So um, what it is to will power, I think, for Nietzsche, is for us to be continuously motivated to face challenges and resistances and obstacles that we then overcome. So seeking power is basically seeking challenges, obstacles, ways to exercise our agency. Um, you can do that in lots of ways. You can do it in an intellectual manner, an artistic manner. You can do it in an aggressive or militaristic manner. But Nietzsche thinks that human beings do have this um, feature of their psychologies that's ineradicable, um, that results from the fact that we're motivated by drives. And what that feature is, is this persistent need, this perpetual need to overcome new challenges and obstacles, not to rest content with anything, but to continue to seek more. Um, so he tries to use that um, which he calls will to power as a constraint on acceptable conceptions of flourishing. So the basic idea would be that um, if it's true that human beings have this will to power, and if we can't change that about ourselves, then any good conception of flourishing is going to have to take account of that fact and not undermine it or imperil it or generate conflicts with it. And he thinks we can use that fact to rule out certain moral systems. Um, it's very complicated how he thinks this works, but the basic idea would be that Christian morality, for example, he thinks it undermines or conflicts with this will to power in various ways, whereas a, a moral system would be more acceptable if it didn't do that, if it didn't generate pervasive conflicts with will to power. So. The way I see his moral system is operating is that okay, there's no universal truth about which moral system we should have, so there's no one right moral system, but there is this criterion that would be applicable to any possible moral system, namely it would have to respect the fact that um, human beings will power. Now there's no one right or wrong way of respecting that fact, so you can get lots of different moral systems, but there are lots of ways of going wrong. or. Uh, having a defective relation to that fact about human nature, and that's where we can critique certain moral systems and view them as defective. So um, for Nietzsche, morality would always be this sort of piecemeal historical discipline where we, we look at where we are now, we look at what values and ideals we have, we think about whether some of those values and ideals might be imperiling this fact about human nature, this will to power, and if they are, we strive to modify that and get rid of them, but there are lots of ways of going forward. There's no one right way of going forward. So it's, it's open-ended in a way. Mm -hmm. So even though Nietzsche might not think that morality is completely relativistic, let's say, it's certainly the case that he thinks that it is ultimately subjective, right? Because we have to subjectively evaluate different moral values and moral truths. I mean, moral values are not things, at least in his perspective, that are uh, empirical in any way. I mean, we can't find them out there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one way of thinking about it is that um, just as we can look at cultural phenomena, uh, you know, look at, I don't know, the institution of having money or political borders or whatever, those aren't facts that are like written into the fabric of the universe. You can imagine societies without them. Um, Nietzsche's thinking that the things we think of as values, moral values, are, are sort of like that. There are these cultural phenomena that arose in a certain historical period. Um, we can critique them. We could, theoretically, we could abandon some of them or at least massively modify them. We've seen such modifications, Nietzsche thinks, in history, like the transition from ancient to modern morality. We could have more of those sorts of things. And one thing we could be doing when we're um, contemplating those sorts of transformations is thinking about how um, those values relate to this thing he's calling will to power and more generally to human flourishing. Yeah, so, so it's not it's not total relativism in the sense that like anything's as good as anything else, but it is subjective in the sense that um, there's not one objectively correct way of proceeding. There are lots of different acceptable ways of proceeding. Okay, so Dr. Katsafanas, let's end the interview here. Uh, before we go, would you like to tell people a little bit more about your work and the best places on the internet, for example, for them to learn more about it? Sure. So I guess the best place to find my work is on my website. So if you 
just search for my name, Paul Casafanis, on the internet, or go to the website. Uh, it's people.bu.edu slash p k a t s a. If you go there, you'll come to my website, and I have um, paper. All of my papers are on that website. Um, my books, you can find links to them on that website as well. I don't have the full books up there, but you can find links. Um, but yeah, I've written a lot about Nietzsche, about the sorts of topics that we've discussed um, during this interview, about his philosophical psychology, his ethical theory. Um, there are lots of papers on those topics up on my website. More recently, I've started working on um, something we haven't really talked about, uh, uh, nihilism and um, how it relates to things like fanaticism and various other kinds of cultural pathologies. So I've, I've I only have a couple of papers on that so far on my website, but I, I'm working on a book on those sorts of topics that hopefully will, uh, give, it's pretty far along, so hopefully it'll come out not in the not too distant future. Um, but I've been working on those sorts of topics, fanaticism, nihilism, some other cultural pathologies, and um, both in relation to Nietzsche and just more generally as a philosophical account of those topics. So you can find some information about that as well on my website if you're interested. Um, but yeah, my website would probably be the best place to, to find all of that stuff. Uh, are you also working on a new book or not? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, um, I'm working on a book um, that's provisionally, I'm uncertain about the title, but for now I'm thinking about the title as The Need for Meaning which is uh, a Nietzschean phrase. He talks about how human beings don't actually need or want happiness. What they want is instead meaning. Um, and then that relates to nihilism and fanaticism and these other things. But um, it's a book that takes off from some of those Nietzschean ideas about how human beings need to have conceptions of their existence that renders them meaningful or intelligible in a certain way. And then I try to draw out um, what that means and how it relates to nihilism how it relates to uh, a type of fanaticism that I think we can see in contemporary culture. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Um, there are a couple of papers on my website. The most recent papers on my website are related to that. There's sort of pieces of that book. Um, but the book as a whole, I've so far I've written a draft of everything but the last chapter. So it shouldn't be too much longer. Um, but I, I'm at work on that as we speak. So. And do you have any idea when it will be out? Um, hopefully it won't be too much longer, so if I could finish that last chapter in a few months, um, it'll probably be at least a year or so, but, um, but once that last chapter is complete, I'll probably post a draft of it up on my website so people could find it there, probably in the next few months I, I would do that. Okay, great. So, Dr. Katsafanas, I will be leaving links to all of your work in the description box of the interview, and I hope people go and check it out because it's very interesting, particularly all the literature on Nietzsche and things like that, as we've been discussing today. And again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you. And I don't know, maybe in the near future, we could do another interview to talk about those aspects of your work and your new book eventually. Sure, that would be great. I, I really enjoyed it. And thanks for these extremely interesting questions. It's been a great discussion. A lot of fun. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar and PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Santel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Gondriano, Jane Eninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Giddy, Doctors Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.